hey, welcome back to 316, a Bible study of Bridgeway Church. We're based in the Tampa, Florida area, and uh, my name is Joel Eason. I serve as the senior pastor at Bridgeway, and uh, welcome to this study. Uh, here at 316, we like to go through the scriptures. We like to go verse by verse when we can, and in other times we'll do summaries, but I'm thrilled that you're with us. Hopefully you've looked at a variety of our other studies, and if they've been beneficial to you, we'd love to have you subscribe to this channel. That way, every time we do a video, it comes to you, and uh, you can follow along with us. Now, uh, here in 2024, we are walking through the Gospels, and uh, we find ourselves in the book of Matthew, and we're actually coming to the close of the book of Matthew and I'm going to go ahead and hop over to our look that we regularly use. And uh, here's where we've been and where we are. Uh, if we were to take an outline of the book of Matthew, uh, this is the outline that we're utilizing based upon the geography that Jesus has ministered in. And I won't take the time to unpack any of these components or each particular week, but uh, we finished with Perea and Judea. Uh, last week and today we find ourselves Jesus is entering into the Jerusalem area. This is going to be the final week of his earthly life before he is uh, crucified and resurrected. And uh, then we're going to have one remaining after tonight where we look at uh, the actual Passover to the crucifixion to his resurrection. And then finally the commission to the disciples of going into all the world. Now, where we are here is, uh, this is what we're looking at for this study. We're going to be covering very quickly chapter 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And uh, so when you see that on there, there's a lot of territory that we've got to cover. So we'll zero in on some parts and then some other parts I'll just summarize. Um, there's no way that we could in an appropriate amount of time go verse by verse through all of these uh, sections, but in chapter 21, you're going to have Jesus coming into Jerusalem. He's going to immediately go to the temple. We're going to look at those two things. Uh, we will see that in Bethany, he curses a fig tree. We'll talk a little bit about what that might have meant. Uh, his authority is going to get questioned by the Pharisees. There will be a couple of parables that he'll give. That'll take to chapter 22, where there's a parable of a wedding, and that's going to be kind of a recurring theme that'll show up uh, in the ministry of the final week. We're going to see he's going to get challenged again about uh, taxes. He's going to get asked a question about marriage at the resurrection, and then he's going to give what commonly is referred to as the greatest commandments. That, that is how it is questioned to him, and uh, we'll zero in on that. Chapter 23 is going to be like zeroed in on the Pharisees. He's going to give seven woes, woe to you. Uh, they're, they're not only warnings, they're like proclamations. And uh, then chapter 24, 25 is going to be what is commonly called the Olivet Discourse. Now, we said in our very beginning that you could also outline the book of Matthew according to discourses or main teachings. There were five, the first one being the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you will have the commission of the disciples where he sends them out two by two, but he gives a very lengthy teaching. There's going to be one around parables. There's going to be one around the kingdom of God. And we're going to find ourselves in this last one, the Olivet Discourse pertaining to end time events. And uh, so I want to show you a couple of verses and then we're going to jump into kind of getting through our territory. So Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now I show that to you because as you can tell, that uh, sounds a lot like, it sounds a lot like uh, his entrance into Jerusalem, coming from Bethany into Jerusalem. Uh, he comes riding on a donkey, and you're going to see that this is the particular passage that is fulfilled. Uh, then you're going to see in Psalm 118, verse 25 through 26, O oh Lord, save us. And where you have save us, it would have been this Hebrew term of yasana, uh, 
Uh, it's kind of two compounds uh, that would eventually in the Greek language be defined as Hosanna, a statement of save us or salvation, but a very depictive statement of save us. We need salvation. O oh Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, you take those two passages from Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118, and then we're going to look at uh, Matthew 21. And it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, so if you could just kind of visualize uh, Jerusalem, if you were to go down the Kidron Valley, which you'll see in a second, come up Mount of Olives, just on the other side of Mount Olives, you have a couple of different towns. Just on the other side of that Mount Olives, you would have Bethpage and Bethany. They're like next door neighbors. Um, for those of us that live in the Tampa area, think like, for instance, Wesley Chapel in Zephyr Hills or Zephyr Hills in Dade City, but not even spread out that far. Uh, for those not in the Tampa area, I've just said towns that neighbor one another. Bethpage and Bethany neighboring one another. So he's coming from this area. Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village ahead of you. And at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. This is a fulfillment of what we read out of Zechariah. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, tell them that the Lord needs them. He'll send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. So you have it for reference, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Now, let's keep going. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them. Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them, uh, ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So, there's a lot of people because they're coming into Jerusalem because it is Passover week. Now, we're going to lean heavier on that in our last talk with the Last Supper, the Passover meal. But that's why there's all these people that are coming into Jerusalem and they are her heralding that he is or could be uh, the Messiah. So there is a great stir about them, and that's why they are saying, Hosanna in the highest. Now, if he is the Messiah, that means liberation is coming. If he is the Messiah, they anticipate, the crowds anticipate, that there is going to be a measure of liberation that will uh, play out. Now, real quickly before we uh, we continue here, or let me, let me show you the next verse. Uh, verse 10 uh, says this, uh, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So this is just a continuation of there their being a great fervor within all of this town. Now, I want to show you a couple things. I'm going to leave this for just a second, and I'm going to show you a view of something so what you're looking at here is a picture that I took from on top of Mount of Olives. And uh, I've highlighted a few things just so that you can maybe get some context of location with things. So these, where you look at from on top of Mount of Olives, what is right immediately at the forefront of the camera, those are actually graves. And they're graves that people pay quite a bit money to be buried. It's very, very, very expensive uh, to be buried on Mount of Olives simply because of Zechariah's prophecies about Jesus coming into, through the eastern gate. Do you see the eastern gate there? That the Messiah, when he sets foot on Mount of Olives, that he will enter into the eastern gate, establishing his reign. And uh, at the resurrection, there are scores of people that will buy a uh, burial location to be, uh, as they anticipate, first with him. True story. But if we go beyond that, um, what you're looking at ahead is what would have been old Jerusalem where the Temple Mount, where you see the dome on the rock, that's that gold ball, that's the Muslim temple, uh, one of the three most holy places for the Muslims in all the earth. 
Um, and that's where the original temple uh, was established. Solomon's temple and then rebuilt following the exile. Uh, that's the temple location that Jesus would have come to. And um, you can see what is below that valley that's called the Kidron Valley that leads up to uh, that Temple Mount area. But if we keep panning over, you see the Southern Steps. So where the Southern Steps area, that's where people would enter into the Temple Mount area. The very famous Western Wall, uh, you see there's a little notification there on the screen with an arrow. The wall that is just underneath that, that arrow, the western wall that you're familiar with, the Wailing Wall that we see, is on the back side of that. So you're not looking at what is famous. What is famous is on the back side uh, because um, Jewish uh, you know, folks are not allowed into the Temple Mount area. So it's on the back side of that wall that is the famous Wailing Wall, Western Wall. But anyway, that southern steps area is where people would enter into the temple area. That's also the area that most likely that there was uh, selling tables that were selling uh, sacrifices or exchange rates for people to be able to uh, give their offering at the temple. So that's going to come into our story in just a second. Uh, you will see over in that territory where Caiaphas, uh, that's where the, the trial of Jesus uh, would have taken place. Um, and then last thing that I'd point out is back on the other side, you see Gethsemane. Gethsemane is at the bottom. You would come down Mount of Olives and you would go down this hill. It's very steep. If you can try and capture in this image the gradient or the degree of how low the Kidron Valley is compared to where I'm taking uh, the photo. So where Jesus is entering in, riding on this donkey, he's going to be coming down a very steep embankment that was carved out today. It's paved. It's a paved road today, but it's the territory. It's the area that was commonly traveled down. And uh, I'm going to show it to you here. This is our team uh, on a trip walking down this road. And uh, we're coming down. Uh, this is all Bridgeway, folks coming down this very steep embankment, this would have been the, the, the path that Jesus would have traveled uh, on this donkey coming into, uh, coming into the, the temple area. And uh, so with that, uh, let me get back over to our verses now. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of robbers. Now, very, very famous um, interaction that happened here. Um, let me talk about this because I think this is important. So this is the second time. This is the second occasion that Jesus drives out those money changers from that southern steps area. And um, why does he do that? We read about it in John chapter 2, the first time that he does it, the very beginning of his ministry. He makes this whip and he drives them out and he has strong comments about uh, perverting or defiling uh, the temple of God. And then he does it again here at the end of his ministry. So I'm going to give you my opinion as to why he does it twice and what that represents. I happen to believe that he is pulling exclusively off of Leviticus 14. So let me show you Leviticus 14. So Moses, in the, the Mosaic Law, it says in Leviticus 14, the priest is to order the house. Now, no, let me pause here. This was an instruction about if there was mildew and mold in a house. Now, with the Mosaic Law, there was a lot of rules about the contamination of the community that would come from one person. So there's laws about a rash. There's laws about if something happens for one, it can spread without the hole or through the hole. So this depiction, this law here is depicting if there's a house that could contaminate the hole, that house has mildew. The priest is to order the house to be emptied before he goes in to examine the mildew. 
so that nothing in the house will be pronounced unclean. After this, the priest is to go in and inspect the house. And then there's a depiction as to what the priest does with rectifying the situation. If there's mold and defilement in the house, there's a clearing out of that house. And then the priest goes in and inspects it. But then watch this in verse 43. It says, if the mildew reappears, so a second occasion, there's going to be a second inspection. If the mildew reappears in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house scraped and plastered, the priest is to go and examine it. And if the mildew is spread in the house, it is a destructive mildew. The house is unclean. It must be torn down. It's stones, timbers, and all the plaster and taken out of the town to an unclean place. So you'll find this in at the very end of our study where Jesus is going to talk about, you see the temple, every part of it's going to be torn down. My opinion is that this is a direct fulfillment of Leviticus 14, where he went in one, inspected the house, cleaned it out, so to say, ran everybody out said, don't defile the house of the Father. And then here, there's another inspection. He comes into Jerusalem. He goes to inspect, and he chases out the money changers who are making profit off of people who had come to give sacrifice. That profit was allowed by the leaders of the temple area, which were the Sadducees. The Pharisees did not control the temple area. The Sadducees did. And it is uh, Jesus clearing this out, in my opinion, fulfilling uh, Leviticus 14, that there was mildew in the house. And he was saying that everything about this is going to be torn down. From that, um, now let's come back to uh, Matthew 21. Uh, in verse 18 to 22, there's going to be a fig tree story. So he is going to leave the temple, or he's going to go back over Mount of Olives, and he's going to come to Bethany. Uh, we know that he's going to look for figs on this particular fig tree, and we could talk about the fruit, the early fruit that figs, fig trees would produce, and it should have figs that were able to be uh, eaten, even if it wasn't in season. But I don't think that that's what's at play. I think the fig tree that we'll see in just a second represents Israel. And so, um, it, and I think I'm right on that. I think the fig tree is representative of Israel. And uh, so it's a nation and a people that should bear fruit. You'll see this in just a second. And because it's not bearing fruit, he's putting a judgment against them. Okay. Now, keep in mind. Also, that when they're going to come back later and find that it is withered, and he has said no more of this tree. My opinion, disagree with me, no problem. My opinion is that this reaches also all the way back to Genesis 3. So Genesis 3, when sin had come, what did Adam and Eve do? They made covering for themselves out of fig leaves. They made, they sewed these coverings for their nakedness that was exposed from sin. And since that time, mankind, you and me, all of us, have been trying to cover our sin with metaphorical fig leaves. And Jesus is going to say no more of this. It is going to be completed, and we'll see that um, at the cross with a final statement of it is finished. But we'll, we'll dive into that in our next one. Uh, in verse 23 through 27, he's going to have his authority challenged by the Pharisees. That was always kind of the groundwork that they would challenge. Um, there's going to be a parable of two sons. He's going. It's, the kingdom of God is like a father who has two sons. He says to them both, go out into the field and work. One says, yes, I'll go, but never does. One says, no, I won't, but eventually does. Who did the work of the father? And uh, this is likening to Israel. It's also an opening of the door to the gospel, to the Gentile nations. Uh, verse 33 through 46 is going to be a parable of the tenants um, that uh, are distributed. And, um, and you're going to have, uh, you're going to have these tenants that are, uh, within territory of, of 
the owner, so to say, the and the owner is going to send servants with an announcement and then send son with an announcement in the parable and the tenants of the property are going to kill the servants and kill the son and um, and so it is obviously a parallel to what had happened through prophets Old Testament and now through the Son of God in Jesus um, from that into verse 43, and I know I've skipped over that quite a bit, but we've got other things we've got to land on. Uh, verse 43 says, So therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Remember, Israel, fig tree, fruit, no fruit. He's, I think the fig, I'm, I know the fig tree is talking about Israel. And um, you have here also that concept of two sons one that says yes and go, doesn't go one that says no and doesn't go you have this statement here capturing both of those scenarios uh, he who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces but he on whom it falls will be crushed when the chief priests and the pharisees heard jesus parables they knew he was talking about them and uh, anytime somebody feels targeted they're going to push against it and that's exactly what happens uh, here, So they looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Once again, it's Passover week. Lots of people are coming in. They're hearing about him. So they're going to have to be savvy in how they try and arrest him. We'll find out next week when we unpack uh, Judas. We'll find out how that all plays out. In Matthew 22, you're going to have a parable of the wedding. And I think this is important because you're going to see that while Jesus taught frequently about the kingdom of God is like, and he uses the kingdom of God is like a field, he uses that frequently when he is up in the northern Galilee area. Uh, there wasn't tons of field uh, farming, so to say, around Jerusalem. You have to leave Jerusalem to do a lot of that. There was a lot of agriculture outside of Jerusalem, going up into Judea and into uh, the Galilee region. Here in Jerusalem, he's going to zero in with these concepts of wedding. You're going to see that a, f a few times. And it's also depicting, I think, what we see in the book of Revelation. He is coming to the point of fulfillment, not just living for the Lord, but salvation and inheritance and reward of eternal life that we'll see in uh, the book of Revelation also. And so we have a parable here of a wedding. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. I'm jumping to verse 8. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. And uh, so we, we read in between that, that there had been a resistant, a resistance to the invitation, a resistance to the king and his invitation to this banquet. And once again, Jesus is speaking very strongly to the Pharisees. He's also speaking strongly to Israel. And, um, and we'll find some of that uh, fulfilled here in just a second. Verse 15 through 22, he's going to be challenged about tax, and uh, that's an interesting thing that he's challenged by because it becomes one of the accusations that the Pharisees use against Jesus with Pilate. They're going to say he refuses to pay taxes. That's not true, but it's what they're going to attest of him. In verse 15 through 22, uh, he's going to be questioned about taxes, and that's basically, do you align with Caesar or not? If you're the Messiah and liberation is coming, then you're not, you're not paying taxes and heeding Rome's rule. So they're trying to pit him not so much about what money is paid. They're trying to pit him in his, his position as Messiah. Um, and so he asked for the coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's because on the coin there's Caesar's inscription. 
Verse 23 through 33, they're going to try and pit again. They're going to question him about, okay, so here's this story or this example of, let's say, for instance, you have uh, this uh, woman who is married, but her husband passes away, and then she's given to his brother, and there's no children, and, you know, and then he passes away, and on and on and on, and they get to resurrection, and uh, whose wife will, they, will she be? Now, if you do your own reading on it, verse 23 through 33, it's an interesting thing that it says very clearly that the Sadducees, the ones around the temple that controlled the temple, the Sadducees uh, were the ones who asked that question. Here's why that's interesting. The Sadducees as a group did not believe in the resurrection. So they're questioning him on something that they don't hold per, per se, but that others do, and they're trying to pit him. Uh, Jesus is going to say that you don't understand, you know, we won't be given in marriage in the kingdom of God, and he answers that. But then um, you have this, uh, they're going to continue to push, and uh, this is the one I kind of want to zero in on here. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, that's what we just had had dealt with that whole Caesar what do you pay and uh, the resurrection and the marriage so the Sadducees kind of give up and the Pharisees take a stab at it the Pharisees got together one of them an expert in the law tested him with this question and when they're testing we've talked about this they're accusing accuse the word accuse coming from the Greek word kategoros to category to separate to define and accusation was all about separation, just like categories are for separation. Uh, when they're testing him, they're trying to separate him from followers, from claims, from moral authority, from popularity. And so they say, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, you probably know this. You have 10 commandments in the Mosaic law. You have 613 elements of law. And uh, the description of how to fulfill that was literally in the thousands. And um, if you were an expert in the law, then you also could use the law in a destructive way. Here's what I mean by that. I, have you ever watched somebody take the Bible and misuse Scripture to accuse people in ways they shouldn't be accused? There's just a total misappropriation of Scripture to attack somebody. And you can take a number of verses. I remember when I was a teenager coming across uh, one verse out of the book of Psalms that says, "Break the arm of the evil, uh, break the arm of the evil doer, seek out his wickedness till none be found." And I, you know, I was like, "You can't make a doctrine about break the arm of the evil doer," but. Sometimes we'll have or see people who take the scripture and use it for their own um, their own purposes. So an expert of the law was could have been really savvy at this. So they test him which which law of those six hundred thirteen do you say is the most important? And Jesus answers with what you and I know as the great commandment: uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. He is quoting what is the Shema Israel. It comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It's not limited to just 4. That's just how it starts. So in the English, it says, Hear, O Israel, like hear, but not just to listen, but to obey and align your life. Align your life, O Israel. Listen and obey, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. And the Hebrew word is Shema. So Shema Israel. And then it says, um, the Lord our God is one. And then it follows that with, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then it talks about impress them upon your kids and uh, host them on your doorposts and whatnot. So he is bringing them back to the Shema Israel. Nobody could have denied that. Nobody could have denied that. But then he does something interesting. He says, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So along with the Shema Israel, he also brings in out of Leviticus 19 verse 18, he brings in to love your neighbor as yourself. 
Um, and that's interesting because if you look at Leviticus 19, Israel was about to go into or they were moving towards promised land and God has given them instructions about when you are dealing with foreigners because you have been a foreigner yourself. Read it. Read Leviticus 19 in that whole section when he's talking about you've been a foreigner yourself. You've been an alien in a territory not yours. So when you have foreigners or aliens within your company, treat them well. Don't mistreat them. Don't hand to them what you pray to be delivered from in yourself. So it's a very, very fascinating way of answering them. And uh, ultimately, the, the expert in the law is going to be like, I can't, I can't attack that. And so he's going to pull away. Um, from that, they're going to go into, we're going to go into chapter 23. And I would contend for sure he's in Jerusalem. I will contend that he's still at the temple. Now, there's probably been a day or so, the different days, you know, other other gospel writers do a better job of depicting what happened on different days, but we'll get into that with Mark and Luke and John. Uh, but he's back at the temple. Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, the teacher of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So basically what he's saying, they sit in a position of authority and they demand that you follow their teaching. But he's going to say, but they don't live it themselves. And he's going to say, do not become like them. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. That's their assessment. Have you ever had, oh, this is touchy ground. Have you ever had a pastoral leader or a Christian leader who, because of their position, has tried to take a authority position over you? You've got to do my convictions. Like I have a conviction that you should pray a certain amount, so you got to pray a certain amount. I have a certain conviction that you can't drink wine, so you can't drink wine. I have a certain conviction that you can't listen to this music, so you can't listen. As pastors and as teachers of the word, we always elevate Jesus and his word and the Holy Spirit that you would walk in relationship with the Holy Spirit. We do not elevate my conviction and you've got to live my conviction. That's a real sketchy place to get. When he says in verse 3, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you, that's their assessment of themselves. But Jesus says, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. Now you imagine you're at the temple and the Sadducees, the Pharisees, they're all there and Jesus is saying this, you're going to be like, if you were one of them, you'd be like, hey, we got to shut this guy down. But what happens in chapter 23 is where he's going to give the seven woes. Woe to you. Like he is, he is just unloading on him. And he's going to give them these seven woes. I'm just going to skim over them. Um, if you add verse 14, then you would have eight. So in a number of translations verse 14 is not in there it's italicized at the bottom as a footnote and that's because that that statement wasn't in all ancient manuscripts so there's lots of debate as to whether that should be there or not i'm not pushing one way or the other i'm just going to say that if you have verse 14 included you would have eight woes if you don't you'd have seven but it's certainly uh most likely that that would been would have been included, but he's saying, woe to you teachers of the law, or woe to you Pharisees. Verse 13, he's going to say, you shut up the kingdom of heaven in men's faces, but you don't enter it. Like you make it hard to connect with the Father. You make it hard on people to have a relationship with God. You think about that verse, and you think about in the book of Acts, chapter 13, then into 14, there's the ministry of Paul and Barnabas, and then in chapter 15, they come to Jerusalem to convene, and what's the phrase they use? We should not make it hard on Gentiles to come to the Lord. And so that's, my opinion, possibly slightly influenced by this statement. You make it tough to enter the kingdom. Verse 14, you devour widows' houses while having lengthy public prayers. You, you are all about show. And yet you will not treat the needy and the hurting 
with any kind of ki kindness. That's all what the prophets were about in the Old Testament. The prophets were saying we have immorality, we have idolatry, and we have injustice. We don't take care of those who are hurting. And, uh, and Jesus is coming against these leaders. Uh, verse 15, you travel distances to make a convert, but then they're worse off than they were before you ever got a hold of them. Um, you've made them worse in their piety than they were. They were actually kind before, but now they're, you know, the, they're worse. Uh, verse 16 through 22, what you swear and demand, he's, he's talking about you swear by the temple or you swear by sacrifices, neither of which are yours neither of which belong or are directed to you, but because you think you control the temple and you think you control the sacrifices, you try and swear by them, but they're not yours. Um, in verse 23 through 24, uh, you keep portions of the law, but you violate the most important values. He talks about you tithe off of your spices, like down to minuscule, minuscule elements of the law, but then you're not merciful and you're not kind and you're not just. Verse 25, you've got the outside looking clean, but the inside's full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, leaders and Pharisees, because you're like whitewashed tombs, but inside you're full of dead bones. And uh, then the last one is that you verbally honor the prophets, but you're of the same heritage of their murders. You carry out the same things. So like verse 23, if this was a movie with sound effects, it would be explosions. It'd be, I mean, he is just, he is unloading on them. And, uh, and then it finishes with, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers chicks under the wings, but you were not willing. Like I tried to pull you close to me, but many of you just resisted. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Okay, remember Leviticus 14, temple, house. Very, very strong visual that Jesus uses with the temple and the house of the Lord being desolate. For I tell you, you'll not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, chapter 24 is going to pick right up off of this. So I'm going to just keep on rolling here. So it says, Jesus left the temple, was walking away with his disciples. Came up, the disciples came up to him to call his attention to his buildings. Do you see all these things? They're enamored. And he asked, because keep in mind, they've been out in Galilee. They've been up in the northern part. They're not always around Jerusalem. So they're admiring renovations that have come to the temple area in their absence. And he says, do you see, all, Jesus says, do you see all these things? He asks, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. That's Leviticus 14. Every one of them will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. So remember, if I could, actually I'm going to switch back over just very quickly. So he has, he has left that temple location. He's come out through the southern steps where he earlier in the week had been doing the money changing are clearing those tables. They're going to come down the Kidron Valley and they're going to come up on top of Mount Olives in some, some capacity looking out over the city. And he's going to, the disciples are going to ask, how will we know when the end is coming? Now from that, let me come back to our pro presenter, our verses. And it says, um, uh, so the, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, remember, we had said with Book of Matthew, you could say five discourses, Sermon on the Mount, the sending of the, the disciples out, but it was a very lengthy discourse. You had parables which was a full discourse. You had life in the kingdom as a discourse. And now you have what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's called the Olivet Discourse, chapter 24 and 25, one teaching on the Mount of Olives. And he is going to give this discourse about what will play out at the end. Now, one thing that I want you to know because of time, I do not have the time to unpack these two chapters in depth. Um, 
In 2022, we did a series, I believe it was 2022, could have been 2021, but we did a series called The End, where we did a whole series of through the book of Revelation. Uh, I did one particular Sunday where I walked through the entirety of the Olivet Discourse. We also had teachings from, um, from Daniel. We connected end times into this whole series, walking through Revelation as it connects to Daniel and the Olivet Discourse, and that was called The End. In 2023, following the attack uh, that happened from uh, the Gaza Strip area towards Israel and the war that broke out uh, with Hamas, um, I did a one-day talk called, Is This the End? And so if you look in the description of this particular teaching down below, uh, I've got the links to both of those uh, areas. And so you can go through that if you want to take those in depth. If you want just one talk, uh, I would say listen to the, Is This the End? talk from 2023, where I just am specifically going through the Olivet Discourse. If you want the full study of Revelation connected to it, go to the series, uh, The End. So with that said, uh, Jesus is going to say, here's going to be the signs that are going to come. You're, there's going to be a massive amount of deception. There's going to be wars and hostility. There's going to be global calamities and all kinds of earthquakes and things that are devastating to the world. Persecution will elevate in an increasing dramatic way to a point that it is a global persecution. There will be a, f a f massive falling away from the Lord and then the tribulation and the Antichrist. Now, I said earlier about the fig tree. Remember that? We're going to see that Israel is the fig tree. Not just I'm not just reaching back, but that's what in the middle of all this, in the middle of all the warnings, he's going to say, how will you know? Pay attention to the fig tree. So let me show you what he's talking about here. It says in verse 32, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. Following tribulation, antichrist, all that warning, he says, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer's near. Even so, what you've learned about the fig tree, he says, even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near right at the door. Now, one of the things that scholars widely hold is that the fig tree that he's talking about here is Israel. When you watch these signs happening with the fig tree, you know that it's underway. When you watch these signs happening with Israel, you know that it is underway. From that goes into chapter 25, which is not a break. It's just a continuation. And he's going to encourage them to remain alert and ready, and he's going to give a parable of ten virgins, five that had oil for waiting for the bridegroom, five that didn't have oil, five that were ready, five that weren't. He's going to give a parable about talents that the that the owner will come and call to account. And um, and then it's going to finish with the great white throne judgment where uh, Jesus has come in glory from Mount Olives. And we read about that in Zechariah. And it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And then he gives the separation of judgment. It says, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another. As a shepherd sh separates the sheep from the goats, he'll put the sheep on his right, goats on his left. And then once again, this is dealing with nations. This is dealing with individuals. And then he gives a very, very familiar teaching, the way he ends the Olivet Discourse. Most of us are familiar with, but not necessarily in the way that he gave it. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Last week of Jesus, he is talking about wedding. He's talking about reward. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about eternity a lot. He says, for I was hungry. You 
You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. I needed clothes. You clothed me. I was sick. You looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Now, most of us are familiar with that. And then the, we're familiar with how it plays out. That They're going to say, but when did we see you? The righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you, thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger invite you in or needing clothes clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Now, there certainly could be a fulfillment there for the individual. That for the individual, that if you are kind and you visit those in prison and you feed people and you nurse people and you clothe people, that it gets and gains the commendation of the Father. That's most assuredly accurate because he has said repeatedly about the Pharisees who strain out the little elements of the law but then reject mercy and kindness. However, the context of what this passage is depicting was of Israel. So you watch Israel. If you want to know what's going on in the world and when end times will play out in the way that the scriptures depict, you watch the fig tree. You watch Israel. And in its context, this statement is about who treats his people well. If you treated his people well, it is an unapologetic position of standing with Israel. Now, that is not to say that everything that the people of Israel do is right, not at all. And that's not, I'm not making this political by any means. However, to separate from this is to miss, to separate from God's uh, priority and covering for Israel is to miss this portion of Matthew chapter 25 in the Olivet Discourse. So while he still while he has given judgment and woes and said this temple will be torn down, you cannot get away from the passages both from Jesus' words and the prophets, Zechariah and others, who are saying that he will come for his people. So it is with that that Jesus is now going to come to the place that he is going to tell the disciples uh, it's time for us to, um, to share in the Last Supper. And I've eagerly desired to share this with you. We're going to talk about Passover. We're going to talk about the blood of the Lamb, the body of the, the Lord, and uh, then His uh, sacrifice, His resurrection, and His commission to the disciples. And we'll do that the week of Easter and hopefully have a phenomenal Easter celebration. Hey, with that said, I hope this has been a good study for you. I hope you'll take it further than I've taken it. You'll do a deep dive on different stuff and uh, that the Lord would bless you. God bless you and I'll see you at the next one.